The Great Zimbabwe stood right at the center of African culture, is one of the most controversial structures thanks to the colonialists that set out to discredit Africans of their greatest achievements. They thought the Great Zimbabwe was way too sophisticated to have been built by Africans. Great Zimbabwe stands at over 32 feet tall and covers over 1,800 acres of land. It's made of dense walls and towers of stone. This incredible structure was built with all dry stone and contains no mortar. It also appears to have been built with no prior architectural planning. This structure is truly extraordinary, but unfortunately, like many parts of Africa, it has undergone immense amounts of abuse. It is said that the Great Zimbabwe thrived over 2,000 years ago, hundreds of years before any Europeans set their eyes or feet on the land. But of course, once they did, Zimbabwe suffered irreparable damage. First came the idea from racist colonialists that Zimbabwe was the home of the Phoenicians thousands of years ago. This theory was later disproven as incorrect speculation. German geologist Karl Marx visited and suggested that Great Zimbabwe was actually of biblical origin. This caused Zimbabwe to suffer cruel abuse from European explorers who were determined to prove that Zimbabwe was not built by Africans, despite the fact that it's in Africa. Cecil Rhodes was the biggest force behind the colonization of the surrounding areas. He desperately wanted to prove the theory of Phoenician origin. He controlled nearby gold mines and therefore wanted to also establish control over the Africans that inhabited the surrounding areas. This way, he could use them for cheap labor. The kicker is that the African miners were way more efficient. They had already exhausted all the gold deposits in the area before the Europeans got to it. Richard Hall was a journalist that was already specifically ordered not to excavate the area, but because of his racist attitude, he did so anyway. He completely stripped the ruins of all its African artifacts in search of some type of proof for the Phoenician origin, but he found nothing that supported his theory. Halls had no archeological training and he did considerable damage, making it almost impossible to get accurate archeological dates for the building of the site. This, of course, was systematically done. In 1906, an unbiased and qualified archeologist visited Great Zimbabwe. His name was David Randall McIver. Despite all of the damage that was done before him, he was able to find proof of the talented builders of this great stone structure. His work proved that Africans build Great Zimbabwe. It was great to have that confirmation, but we already knew that. His structural analysis proved that the despised native Africans were actually capable of building such an amazing structure. His findings were dismissed by Rhodesia's white governor. It would be another two decades until another qualified archeologist was allowed back on the site. In 1929, Gertrude Caton Thompson investigated Great Zimbabwe. This was at the request of the British Association. Her findings, of course, confirmed David Randall's discoveries. Every single artifact she found was that of African origin. In 1971, the white Rhodesian government prohibited the mentioning of any African connections to the building of the Great Zimbabwe in all tour guide material. In 1980, after a bloody civil war, the government of Rhodesia went under black majority rule. African students were now able to learn and apply valuable archeological techniques so that they can study and understand their own culture. With their knowledge and the findings of the experienced and unbiased archeologists, we've learned that the first people to settle in Great Zimbabwe was the Shona people. Great Zimbabwe was the home to approximately 18,000 inhabitants. It also thrived while Europe languished. The Shona people also shared with us their spiritual beliefs and traditions. The word Zimbabwe means house of stone in the Shona language. There are over 200 of these stone structures across the Southern African inland plateau. The structure also contains an ancient drainage system, which still works, that funnels water from inside of the homes to outside of the homes and into the valleys. 
The outer wall of the Great Zimbabwe shows architectural structure that is unparalleled in Africa or anywhere else. Great Zimbabwe consisted of over 2,000 goldsmiths, potters, weavers, and blacksmiths, as well as stonemasons that knew to heat the large granite rocks in fire before tossing water on them. The cold water shocked and cracked the granite, which is what allowed them to be stacked without mortar. Millions of these stones were produced and carried uphill while the city constantly expanded. More than 4,000 gold and 500 copper sites were found within the area. For three centuries, over 40% of the world's gold came from Zimbabwe. This was a total of about 600 tons of gold. Thousands of gold necklaces were found within the ruins. Prosperity at Great Zimbabwe came to a halt around the 15th century when trading declined and people migrated to other areas. Archaeologists believe that the site was abandoned due to a shortage of food and natural resources. That's simply theoretical because we don't know for sure what exactly caused the fall of Zimbabwe. Once the word spread of this breathtaking abandoned city, of course the greedy Europeans wanted parts and that's when it all went downhill. The most important artifacts found in Great Zimbabwe were eight Zimbabwe birds carved out of soapstone that stood about five feet tall. The sculptures combined both human and bird-like elements. These birds resembled the comedic deity Haru, also known as Ra. The towers at Great Zimbabwe are oriented to face the Northern Star constellation. This is intriguing because it mirrors the same techniques used to build the pyramids of Giza. Also, the mathematics used to build these towers resemble that of ancient Kemet. The precedent for contact between the Kemites and other Africans are also demonstrated by Mali's Dogon tribe whose knowledge of the Sirius star system, as we discussed in an earlier post, can also be regarded as part of the legacy of the Nile Valley civilizations. These similarities are not only found in Great Zimbabwe and Mali, but also in other parts of Africa and the Americas. This is why it's so complicated to pinpoint exactly where we as African people come from. Our ancestors were nomads that migrated whenever and wherever they wanted to. And they also left their mark everywhere they went, which is all over the world. Great Zimbabwe is more proof that not only are we as Africans Aboriginal, but we are also all connected no matter where we end up.